This is our first lesson for the day. It's found on page 298 in our uh, Pew Bibles. I welcome you to look that up in case I mess it up. And it is Deuteronomy 15, verses 12 through 18. And I found that every time that I go exploring or read the lesson in the Bible, I learn something new. And this has taught me something new today. The title of this segment is called Freeing Servants. If a fellow Hebrew or a man or a woman sells himself to you and serves you six years, in the seventh year you must let him go free. And when you release him, do not send him away empty-handed. Supply him liberally from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Give to him as the Lord your God has blessed you. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I give you this command today. But if your servant says to you, I do not want to leave you, because he loves you and your family and is well off with you. Then take an awl and push it through his earlobe into the door, and he will become your servant for life. Do the same for your maidservant. Do not consider it a hardship to set your servant free, because his service to you these six years has been worth twice as much as that of a hired hand. And the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture lesson for today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. It goes like this. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set out for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. 
Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Well, today we are celebrating two holidays. The first one is very familiar to all of us. It is Father's Day. The day that we honor all of the people who are our fathers or those in our lives who love and care for us like fathers do. And while you may know that it is Father's Day, what you may not know is that the very idea of Father's Day was inspired by a sermon in church. In 1909, Sonora Smart sat and listened to her pastor preach on Mother's Day at Central Methodist Episcopal Church in Spokane, Washington. Now, Sonora was one of six children, children who did not have a mother in their lives. Instead, they were being raised by their Civil War veteran father, William Jackson Smart. After church that day on Mother's Day, Sonora went to her pastor and advocated for a Sunday service to celebrate fathers. She said it should be the next year and in June. After a year of planning, it became so. Father's Day was first celebrated on June 19, 1910 in Spokane, Washington at the YMCA. Sonora and her pastor got the Spokane Ministerial Alliance to put on the event, and on that day they celebrated the attributes of good fathers everywhere. And we love Father's Day. But in addition to it being Father's Day, today is also Juneteenth, a very important date in the history of U.S. slavery. After Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves in the United States with the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, not all states, not all places complied. Some masters, particularly in the southern states, did not want to give up the people that they viewed as their rightful property without a fight. It was on June 19th 1865 that General Gordon Granger issued order number three in Galveston, Texas, freeing the last of the slaves. Thus, June 19th became an annual day of celebration among people freed from slavery. Juneteenth was typically celebrated by people dressing up in their finest clothes having a joyful celebratory worship service at their church, followed by a picnic with a lot of good food. It was a day of gratitude to God for their freedom. The cage of slavery had been broken into pieces, and so they could be free at last to live their lives without worry that their families would be broken apart or that their spouses, fathers, or children could be sold and carried away by the highest bidder. Now in our summer sermon series this year, we are exploring the works of various poets and authors. And today our poem is a very famous work by the beloved poet Maya Angelou. You'll find a copy of the poem as an insert in your bulletin. The poem is Caged Bird. It goes like this. A free bird leaps on the back of the wind and floats downstream till the current ends and dips his wing in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky. But a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through his bars of rage. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. 
The cage bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. The free bird thinks of another breeze, and the trade winds soft through the sighing trees and the fat worms waiting on a dawn bright lawn, and he names the sky his own. But a caged bird stands on the grave of dreams, his shadow shouts on a nightmare scream, his wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The cage bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but long for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. When I read this poem, I remember the spirituals that the slaves would sing together when working on the plantation. Many of their songs were about getting away to freedom on the Underground Railroad. They sang songs like, Follow the Drinking Gourd, which was a reference to the Big Dipper. They sang songs like, Wade in the Water, which was about crossing the river to get to free country. They sang Song of the Free and Steal Away, and go down Moses to remind them of how the children of Israel were freed from Egypt. While they as slaves were not physically free, the slaves here in the United States sang of freedom with that heart of a bird in a cage. It was the only thing that they could do in the moment to keep their hopes alive in a world where there was no way out of the circumstances that were holding them captive. Now today, while slavery is illegal in the United States, there are still many racist elements in our society that act like a cage that hold people of color captive. And sometimes those people and those policies destroy those very people that they are supposed to serve and protect. Now the first week of June I was in Minneapolis and on my way home I stopped at George Floyd Square and I took some photos and videos. I recognized the place immediately from those images on television from 2020 when the people were rioting in protest of the death of George Floyd under the knee of a policeman. And I wanted to know more about this man. George Perry Floyd Jr. was born in 1973 in Fayetteville, North Carolina. George was a descendant of slaves. His family had worked extremely hard as sharecroppers to build their lives up during the Reconstruction years following the Civil War. But ultimately, over the subsequent decades, they had lost their hard-earned gains through Jim Crow laws and racist policies. When George was two, his parents divorced. His mother moved herself and her five children to the Bricks, a primarily African-American housing development in Houston's Third Ward. As the oldest of five children, George frequently had childcare responsibilities for his younger siblings. Nevertheless, his large physical size offered George some real life opportunities. He was over six feet tall by middle school and George saw sports as a vehicle to help him improve his life. He played basketball and football and when his Texas uh, when his high school team went to the Texas State Championships, George earned himself a football scholarship to go to college. He started out at Florida, South Florida Community College, but then later he transferred to Texas A&M. 
However, the multiple pressures of holding down a job, playing sports, and keeping his grades up all proved to be too much. George Floyd ended up dropping out of college. He moved back to Houston. He became an automotive customizer, and he tried to make it in the music industry as a rapper. But the drug culture soon gripped George Floyd. And between 1997 and 2005, George Floyd served eight jail terms for everything from drug possession to trespassing. Caged by the permanent label of felon, George faced even more difficulty finding and holding down an honest job. In 2007, he participated in an armed robbery in a woman's apartment, searching for items to steal. After he was caught, George's plea deal got him five years in prison, from which he was paroled in 2013. Following his five years in a cage, George was determined to turn his life around, to stay out of jail for good. He got involved with a church program called Resurrection Houston. George mentored young men and he created and posted vi uh, videos on social media that were anti-violence. And then he got involved with a program that brought young men out of the third ward of Houston and brought them to Minneapolis to start their lives over with a program of drug rehabilitation and job placement. So in 2014, George Floyd moved from Houston to Minneapolis in order to rebuild his life and to find work. He had turned his life over to God. And while he was still struggling with his drug addiction and still sometimes gave in to using dope, he had hope for a brighter future. George was working as a security guard and he was hoping to complete the classes in order to become a commercial truck driver. While George would be the first to admit that he had made some really big mistakes in his life, there was nothing that he had done to deserve his murder under the restraining knee of a racist Minneapolis police officer on May 25th, 2020. As the world watched the bystanders' phone videos in horror, the racism that was on display illustrated some of the biggest problems we face as a country. Those in power simply don't care about the problems experienced by the least of these in our society. They don't care enough to check if a restrained person can still breathe. They don't care about the systemic poverty and the policies that keep people down. Soaring astronomically high rents don't mean anything to folks who have already secured their own low interest mortgages. Some whites don't see or care that black people don't get hired as quickly or that they have a harder time getting promoted. And when a white kid gets probation for the very same drug charge that gets a black kid sent to jail, we have systemic racism that not only needs to be seen by those in power, it needs to be changed. Everyone deserves to be given a second chance, even those who hurt us most deeply. In our sermon scripture today, we have the very familiar story of the prodigal son, the child who takes the resources and the gifts that they have been given and squanders their chances and burns their bridges. Make no mistake about it, the ungrateful son by asking for his inheritance was wishing that his father was already dead and gone from his life. The boy's mistakes in his misspent youth are just as common of a story 
as the life of George Floyd as he got all tangled up in drugs and placed in prison. But both the prodigal son and George Floyd himself found love and forgiveness in the arms of their father. As the prodigal son came home and his father came running to meet him, God met George Floyd with love and forgiveness. God forgave him and set him going on a better path with a second chance to make a difference with his life on the world. So what does all of this mean for those of us hearing it today? The first thing to remember is that our God is a God of second chances, a God of forgiveness, running toward us, calling out our names in love. God wants to welcome us home, to invite us to sit again at the table as one of God's own beloved children. My friends, don't turn your back on that invitation and go off on your own way again. We are all invited to accept that invitation of love and to join in the community of faith. Secondly, as we live and work together as God's own children, it is our responsibility to love and to care for our neighbors, to dismantle the cages of racism that still hold our brothers and sisters captive. The hatred and the injustice that hold people down and stifle their ability to live fully and free in our world, those are the things that clip the wings and tie the feet of millions of people. For we are all children of God, our Father in heaven. And may we all learn to act in love and to forgive and to take care of our brothers and sisters throughout the world. So be it. Amen. Amen. You could please stand.